to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Revelation 14, verse number 13. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Revelation. This is our final lesson in this series on Revelation, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our study together today. In fact, as always, we want to encourage you, if you haven't got your Bible handy, Find it, locate it, get it handy, as we're going to look to the Word of God together in our study today. Friend, as we said, we're so glad you've joined us. We want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you. Today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the Churches of Christ, the Lord's Church in your area. They would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to learn more about the plan of salvation or worship or how the church uh, addresses uh, matters of morality or whatever it may be, they'd be happy to sit down and discuss the Scriptures with you. You'll find people there who love God, who love the truth, and are concerned about men and women going to heaven. And so check out the Lord's Church in your area. You can also look on our website. We also have a church locator that you can visit that would point you in that direction also. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, our whole motive and our whole aim is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We just simply want to help men and women know God's will and ultimately go to heaven. Uh, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or of any of our lessons, won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our materials online. We've got a wide variety of good Bible study material, and it's all available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons helping us to better understand the sometimes difficult book of Revelation, we'd love to make that available to you free of charge. Go to our website, log on there at thegospelofchrist.com. You can go to our media request form, request our media there. We can send it to you immediately as a digital download, or if you need a DVD to watch or a CD to listen to, we'll also send that to you in the mail in hopes that it will encourage and help in our study of God's Word. And friend, don't forget, in our world where everybody almost has a smartphone, we have apps available, both in the Apple and Android store for the Gospel of Christ app. Great way to study the Word of God in our fast-paced world. Let's now turn our attention to the second half, overviewing the second half of the book of Revelation. In our three previous lessons, we looked at, in two lessons, seven keys that will help us unlock the book of Revelation. And then in our last lesson, we overviewed the first 11 chapters in the book of Revelation. Now we're going to continue that idea and close out this series by looking at chapters 12, through 22 in the book of Revelation to kind of give an overview of the main message of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, you now have this, this vivid image of the dragon, the woman who's pregnant with child, the dragon who's waiting to thwart God's plan and, and, and ultimately to destroy salvation, and Christians are wondering, how in the world can we defeat such a monstrous beast as a dragon? Look at how you defeat him. Satan is the dragon. Revelation 12, 9, Revelation 20, 1 through 6, the devil is clearly identified as Satan. How does the Christian defeat Satan? That's a, a question for the ages, right? Look at Revelation chapter 12, and I want you to notice the threefold way they defeated Satan and how we can as well. The Bible says of these Christians, they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. How do you defeat Satan? Sacrifice, Scripture, 
and self-sacrifice. Friend, there's a threefold plan right there to defeating the devil. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Friend, you will never defeat Satan if you're not in Christ. It's his blood that washes us from our sin, Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6, and it is his blood and his sacrifice that defeated Satan, Hebrews 2, verses 9 through 14. Then they overcame him by the word of their testimony. What is that word of their testimony? Well, friend, that's the message of the gospel. That's the word of God that we have today. And you know, Jesus did the same thing with Satan, right? Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is tempted by the devil, Satan throws everything he has at him. And Jesus says three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. I've got to have the blood of Christ. I've got to have that applied to my spirit. And when I obey the gospel and baptism, I contact the death and blood of Jesus. Romans 6 verses 3 through 4. I must have God's word in my heart and hide it in my heart that I might not sin against him. Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12. And then notice that final way. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. Self-sacrifice. That is, we're willing to give ourselves every day to the cause of Christ. If any man desires to come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Friend, if I'm going to be a faithful child of God, I've got to realize when I obey the gospel, it's no longer about me. I gave myself to the cause of Christ. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And listen to these words, and you are not your own. What do you mean I'm not my own? You are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. They overcame Satan by Christ's blood, by the Word of God and by having a sacrificial attitude. And friend, anybody who defeats Satan makes it to the glory land today has to have that same attitude. Then in chapter 13, as we think about overviewing the theme of the book of Revelation, we are now introduced to the sea beast, the land beast, and that ever memorable number 666. In our second lesson on the introduction, we showed very clearly from the scripture that the sea beast works under the dragon and that he would represent Rome. The land beast, uh, Rome and her rulers, and then the land beast, based on the details of Revelation 13, would be those who are enforcing the worship of uh, Rome and her rulers, those who are marking people who are faithful to Rome and her rulers. That would be the Roman militia or the Roman uh, government at that time. And so the sea beast is Rome. The militia is the land beast. They're enforcing worship. And, and, and of these, of all these, the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast, they are all falling incomplete in God's mindset. That number, 666, what does that represent? Well, friend, I've heard all kind of things mentioned. So many people have questions about this number in the Bible. I remember one time hearing a story about a family. They pulled into their driveway. And for some reason, the dad looked down at the odometer and it ended in 666. So they pull the car out and drive around the block one more time. Is 666 some unlucky to negative idea? Is that to be taken literally? Well, friend, when we discussed signs and symbols that will help us to understand the book of Revelation, in our first lesson, we mentioned that the number seven is the complete number. You've got God representing three, you've got the earth representing four, the totality of all of God and His creation, the completeness of it. Seven is the complete number. Six falls one short of seven and thus would be incomplete. Six, six, six is imperfection, incompletion taken to the extreme. And my friends, that's what Rome, that's what Satan, that's what Rome, that's what Rome's rulers, and that's what those who follow and worship the beast are. They're imperfect. They're incomplete. They're missing because they don't have Christ in their life. And so chapter 13 kind of sets us up 
for that idea. Then chapter 14, as we continue with the book of Revelation, we find a very encouraging passage in chapter 14. I want you to look in Revelation 14, verse number 13 with me. John says in Revelation 14, 13, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works. Do follow them. You've got this grand scene of the saved of the ages in Revelation 14. And as Christians are thinking about this, as, as these Christians in the town of Sardis are thinking about what's going on, as they have heard about people, Christians, who've been drug out of their homes. Some have been thrown before the lions and devoured. As they're hearing that, what, what kind of hope and comfort does Christian, do Christians receive from the book of Revelation? Here's what God says. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. In essence, Jesus says, to these suffering Christians, if you die faithful to me, it's a blessing. You no longer have to deal with these struggles and you get to go on to your reward. And friend, for every Christian who had lost somebody and for every Christian who in their mind is, is cognizant of the fact that they might have to give up their life for the cause of Christ, what an encouragement to know that dead people who die in Christ are blessed. How is that? Because death has been defeated through Jesus. Hebrews 2 verses 9 through 14. And because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll never really die. We have the promise of eternal life. John chapter 11 verse 25 and 26. Matthew chapter 25 verse number 46. And so Christians in the first century were greatly encouraged by that. What about us today? Have you ever lost anybody who was very dear to you? who died faithful in the Lord. Remember the Lord's church, maybe, maybe husband and wife, maybe son or daughter, uh, maybe somebody else who was very close to you and they were a faithful member of the Lord's church. Friend, what a blessing it is to know that they were in the Lord and that they have rest from their labors and their works do follow them and that like Lazarus who was in the uh, Abraham's bosom, we have that promise and that hope as well. And so what a beautiful encouragement of Revelation 14. Verse number 13. Now let's direct our attention to chapter 15, and I want you to see the victory song that Christians are going to be singing. Look at chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. There is this, this prelude, this uh, building up to the bowls of God's judgment, and Christians are seen in their victorious state even here. Those who don't have the mark of the beast and who aren't following him, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb say, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested." When I hear this idea, Song of Moses, what does that draw our mind back to? Remember, to Christians who are suffering at the hand of an evil government, that immediately makes them think of God's people also at another time suffering at the hand of an evil government. You remember Egypt and Pharaoh and Exodus? God's people are being forced to work without the proper tools, supplies there, uh, the, the male children outside of Moses are being killed. There is oppression. There is hatred. There are hard times in Egypt. God sends forth a deliverer, Moses. Moses goes to Pharaoh multiple times. Let my people go. The ten plagues are brought down. Finally, with that last plague, Moses and Israel are released to go and worship God, to go serve God. And you remember, as they head off, Pharaoh begins to come after them. They reach what we know of as the Red Sea. God opens up the Red Sea. God's people go through on dry land. 
When the soldiers of Pharaoh's army begin to enter that Red Sea, the waters come crashing down. They are all destroyed. God's people march across on the other side victorious. And in Exodus 15, they sing that song to God's glory of Moses and the victory God gave them. But now this is a new song. It's not only a song of Moses. It's the song of Moses and the Lamb. What's that imply? Just like Christian, just like God's people were suffering then and God greatly delivered them from their oppressors, God's people who are suffering today will one day be singing this song when God greatly delivers them from their oppressors. And that did happen. Rome went to ruin. Christianity flourished and grew and, and still so today. And so we see the great victory Christians are promised and how they're singing that as a prelude to God's judgment on the nations. All right then, turn to chapter 16. And here's what I want you to see. In chapter 16, we see part of those bowls of judgment being unleashed. But now we come to a term that so many people have skewed that I want us to spend just a moment thinking about it. Look in Revelation chapter 16, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 16. In this great battle that's going to occur where God's people are going to be victorious, the Bible says, And they gathered them together to the place in Hebrew called Armageddon. We've all heard about. Books have been written about it. Rapture theorists have jumped on this idea. A multiplicity of false doctrines have been spawned by Armageddon. Armageddon's coming. Are you ready for it? Well, friend, what, what is this battle of, of Armageddon? The words Armageddon, Armageddon, literally means the battle of Mount Megiddo. Now, What's that? That doesn't sound quite as, uh, quite as elaborate, uh, quite as religiously illustrious, we might say. The Battle of Mount Megiddo. What was that? What did that mean to first century Christians? When, someone, when, when, when a Christian in Philadelphia heard that, what did his mind think about? Naturally, it would go back to Judges chapter 5. There was a battle of Megiddo, and here's the whole storyline of it. Because of God... The battle was over pretty much before it started. God's people at the battle of Megiddo in Judges 5, they were victorious. We read about it in verse 19. They were victorious. God wiped out the enemies. They wouldn't serve God. As a result, God uh, brought His uh, anger and His vengeance down upon them. And pretty much the battle, battle was over before it started and God is victorious. Friend, that's the idea of the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Megiddo that is brought up here is to show Christians this isn't even going to be a battle. There's gonna, there may be some hard times. There will be some suffering. There's going to be intense persecution. But when God decides the battle's over, you won't even know there'd been a battle because God will deal with them in His anger and His justice. And so again, to encourage these Christians... They needed to remember and know God would right all wrongs. God would reap His anger and His vengeance upon Rome, and Rome would be just a, a shadow of a memory compared to what it once was and how true that is indeed today. And so we think about the hill of Megiddo and the great battle and God's victory there. Then I want you to turn to chapter 17, and I want you to see why this battle is going to be so amazing. The battle is going to be over before it starts because of the one we have as our commander. Revelation chapter 17, verse number 14. The Bible says, In this great battle, these will make war with the Lamb. Now watch this. And the Lamb will overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. How is it that Christians are going to win the battle today? Because of the Lamb. The one who washed us in His blood, Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. The one who was slain, the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation chapter 5. The Lamb who gave His life as a sacrifice, John 1, verse 29. And to the Son of God, the Lamb Jesus Christ, who is currently reigning at the right hand of God. These Christians needed to know Jesus is not dead. Christianity is not over. This is but a blip on the radar, and because Christ is the commander of your army, you will overcome. 
you will prevail. Those who are called, chosen, and faithful will go with Him to glory. And so, friend, when we, when we face obstacles today, when we face oppression, when, when Christians and church and the church deals with problems, we need to remember Jesus is still the head of His church. Ephesians 1, verses 21 through 23. Jesus has promised one day He's coming back to take us to glory. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. And if we remain true, there's a great day coming when God also will right all wrongs and Christians ultimately will be victorious. God will say to those who have been faithful, Well done good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. All right, chapter 18 then, we learn that God, Christians needed to know, and they hear it clearly here, God is going to deal with sin and sinful people in His own time and in His own way. Look in Revelation chapter 18, and I want you to notice what is said in verse number 5. Of this great Babylon, the harlot Rome, it is said in Revelation 18, verse 5, watch this, For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Friend, God knows what's going on in the first century there. God knows what Rome has done. God recognizes that wrong. You know, sometimes we wonder when sin happens, when bad things happen, and we think, Man, nobody knows and nothing's being done about this. And why is it something happening? God knows when evil happens. God knows when sin occurs. And their sins have reached up to heaven, meaning God is angered by that. And God is going to deal with that in His own time and His own way. I don't know why. We don't, we don't know why. We're not told why. God didn't deal with it. God allowed that to go on for a while. We're not Today, when things happen that we don't always understand, and we think, why is this not being addressed more readily? Why are we having to wait and deal with this? Why are Christians having to suffer? You know, we don't always know the reason as to that. But we, don't, we may not know the why, but we know the who. God knows when evil happens. God cares for His people. Evil people and their sins, God's aware of that. And God is going to address that. Christians will be vindicated. His church will be gl glorious and victorious. And evil people, if they, and we don't want them to be lost. God doesn't want them to be lost. But friend, if evil people remain in sin, they ultimately will face the judgment and the wrath of God. And chapters 19 through 21, Give us a picture of all of that. In chapter 19, verse 10, we learn that God is still on the throne and we must worship Him. Look in Revelation chapter 19, verse number 10. The Bible records these words. Revelation 19, verse 10. There is this one who peers. John fell at his feet to worship this angel. He said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When a lot of people are trying to direct men and women's attentions to a lot of different areas, we need to remember our focus is on worshiping and serving God. Now, at the end of the chapter, chapter 19, the beast that we heard about, Rome and the beast, and the, they're all destroyed. They're all defeated by God. God is ultimately victorious over them. And Christians are encouraged greatly knowing we focus on God. We worship Him. We give glory to Him. And God, He'll be the one that receives that. And we won't have to worry about all these other things. Then in chapter 20 through 22, we see about uh, the judgment and we hear about how beautiful heaven's going to be. Look in chapter 20 and we see a great judgment scene. Satan is now bound. The saints are reigning with Christ. And look at what happens in chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Then John saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, 
standing before God. And books were opened. And another book is opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. They were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Here you have this picturesque image of God bringing His judgment on evildoers. The dragon cast, locked up. The beast, the two beasts, the harlot, they're all going to be judged by God. The dead, small and great. Those who were something and those who may not have been anything. Everybody's going to be judged by Almighty God. We're judged according to the things that we do in this life. We're judged by things written in the books. One of those, no doubt, is the Word of God, and then we have reference to as well the book of life. And friend, those who are Christ, they overcome the second death. They get to live with God forever. And what a great thing it is to know we have our name written in the Lamb's book of life. On the judgment day, if I remain true to God, friend, it'll all be worth it. Heaven will surely be worth it. In fact, Look at how beautiful heaven is pictured here. As an encouragement to these Christians, they're reminded of what heaven means. Look in Revelation 21, verse 4. And in heaven, God, the Bible says, and God will wipe away, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Look at Revelation 22, verse number 5. Of this place it is said, There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. When you think about these final three chapters, 20, 21, and 22, there's that great victory and judgment scene. Christians are given the hope, reminded of the hope of heaven. They're reminded they can be with God, and Jesus reminds them, I'm going to address these things in a short time. And so today, as we think about problems that arise, as we think about difficulties that we might face, as we think about the book of Revelation, the ever-abiding message is Christ, His church, and His kingdom, His people, will always be victorious. If I remain faithful unto death, Christ will also give me the crown of life. Friend, we hope that you have enjoyed our study in the book of Revelation, and we encourage you to join us next time as we're going to study more from the Word of our God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.